Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamu alaikum dear participants. So today we are starting a new series. This will be a monthly series in which I will be giving lectures on the mizan of my teacher Ustaz Javed Ahmed Qamidi. As you all would have uh, would be already knowing that this is a book which he completed uh, way back in 2007 uh, which is his understanding of the contents of religion. and he has also written a summary of this book in the form of uh, islam a concise introduction uh, available in english also so uh, i will take the topics from mizan which has uh, which is in english called islam a Co- comprehensive introduction uh, you can look up the dobara karo i'm sorry i'll have to start again bismillah arrahman arrahim viewers today we are going to begin a new lecture series which is going to be a monthly lecture series uh, these lectures would be based on the book mizan uh, translated into english by the name islam a comprehensive introduction as you all know that this book has been authored by our teacher javed ahmed ghamidi it is a book which he completed about 15 years ago way back in 2007 uh, this book actually uh, is his understanding of the contents of religion uh in the forward to this book uh, he has explained the principles of interpreting religion which he has uh, formulated of course he heavily relies on his two illustrious predecessors ustaz aminuddin farahi and ustaz amin asad islahi ustaz amin asad islahi was is someone with whom he spent uh, a lot of uh, his life and uh, from 1973 onwards right up to 1993 which is about 20 years uh he spent his time studying with him uh, the quran uh, and some of the very basic subjects so his own understanding of religion as i said is uh, drawn from the principles which have been formulated and enunciated by ustaz hamiduddin farahi and ustaz amin asan islahi uh this uh, lecture series uh, would not be in the same order as the order that you can see in the book uh it will we will take up different uh, subjects and different topics and different chapters So today uh, we take up the chapter which is called the dietary sharia and as you can see from the very name of the of the topic that in this uh, lecture uh, I will try to explain his viewpoint regarding the dietary laws of religion and as far as these dietary laws are concerned uh, we know that there are certain basic premises that we have to understand so inshallah I will try to point out those principles the way he has uh, uh, laid them down in his book mizan and once again just to uh, let you know that this series is entirely based on his point of view and uh, of course at the end of each session you will have the the opportunity to ask questions uh, regarding uh, these lectures but as i said that this would be once a month and mostly uh, on the th- on the third week uh, the third saturday of every month and uh, so we begin Uh, this chapter or this, uh, begin this discussion of the dietary sharia now ustaz javed ahmed ghamidi the way he has explained this in his book uh, in this particular chapter he says that as far as original guidance from uh, the almighty is concerned in this regard uh, we already have that guidance innately found in us so externally the sharia was not needed to guide us uh, it was only needed to clarify certain issues which uh, in which human intellect could have faltered and the sharia guided uh, us in those issues otherwise as far as the dietary laws are concerned what we should eat and what should we abstain from our own human nature is the best guide so it's our in, innate guidance which is the best judge in this regard so he has uh, actually cited the quran and uh, before even citing the quran i think the basic principle which you can see that i have uh, presented before you it is my deduction of his uh, of his understanding and that is that at no place has a sharia presented a complete list of clean edibles when i say the word clean of course here it refers to wholesome and pure uh, edibles which relate to uh, what is permissible and edibles of course in- include both things which are eaten and drunk so basically uh, it is our own human nature it's our own innate guidance our inborn guidance which is sufficient to let us know what exactly is permissible it is our own internal mechanism which tells us that we have what we have to eat and what we have to abstain from so therefore he has cited this uh, quranic verse which you can see is being displayed right before you this is uh, verse 5 of uh, surah maida which is the fifth surah 
he says uh, by citing it, all clean things are lawful to you. So the word tayyibat in Arabic uh, has a very special connotation. Tayyibat means uh, things which are wholesome and uh, pure with regard to their eating. So the word clean actually is not a very accurate translation, I would say. Uh, what is meant here is what, things which are wholesome uh, for eating. And as an obvious corollary to this, uh, things which are forbidden uh, as a result are those which are not wholesome, which are not pure and not clean. And then he says that while inviting the Jews and Christians to profess faith in Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Almighty has referred to the extremist attitude they had adopted while with regard to food and drinks in the following words. And actually it has, uh, I mean, this verse also tells us that how uh, the prophet, uh, how the last prophet would come and he would actually uh, loosen these shackles and these burdens which they had laid upon themselves, the, the people of the book. And the words are, so, and this prophet allows them as lawful what is appropriate for eating. So, another translation for the word tayyibat here is appropriate for eating, what is wholesome for eating, and prohibits them from what is inappropriate for eating. He releases them from their heavy burdens and from the yokes that were upon them. So, one of the uh, objectives of the last prophet, which this verse actually tells us is that he will come and he will actually once again revive uh, the, this, uh, this concept of uh, what is clean and what is unclean uh, regarding what food, items and uh, edibles we should drink. I mean, this is something which is already found in our human nature because, but because of perversion and distortion and some of the other innovations that had crept him, he once again revived that uh, these are the things that people should uh, they, sh they should know while uh, while they are drinking or while they are eating that this these are the things which are appropriate for this purpose. So what we have to understand here as a result is that it is this innate guidance. This is this inborn guidance which tells us what 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 we should eat and what we should not eat. Similarly, what we should drink and what we should not drink. Now, it's in spite of this, that we find that there are certain things which the Prophet himself is supposed to have uh, uh, stated that they are not permissible. And Ustaz Javed Ahmad Ghamidi has, uh, has explicitly said that when the Prophet uh, prohibits something, it's not that he is prohibiting that thing afresh or anew, but it is something which is already found in our human nature, already found in our innate guidance. And all that he is doing, so, uh, doing is that he is just explaining that innate guidance that we already have in ourselves. So the two things which he has in this regard, uh, uh, proscribed are animals with sharp canine teeth and birds having claws and or tentacles in their feet. So you see that uh, what uh, what the things which make an animal, whether it be a bird animal or a land, I mean, whether it be a bird or a land animal, uh, or even a sea animal, is that savagery uh, which is depicted as a result of uh, or or its beastliness, uh, which is depicted as a result of its. Uh, uh, sharp teeth, which are made to tear, uh, open the, the prey, uh, to cut it apart, to tear it apart and eat its meat. And birds with claws and tentacles, of course, they are also of a very similar nature. You can see vultures having those uh, tentacles and claws in which they uh, pounce upon their prey and cut it open. So this is nothing but our own innate guidance, because from our own innate guidance, we know that lions and tigers and vultures and all these uh, savage animals uh, or savage birds, I would say, or these beastly birds, uh, we would never eat them. They never form part of our uh, edibles. And when the prophet said that uh, such uh, animals are prohibited, he was not uh, adding something to the list of this prohibition. All that he was doing was he was explaining something that we already have in our human nature. So we have to understand that uh, if people have added to the list by saying that there are some things which the Quran has prohibited and some other things which our Hadith or the Prophet has prohibited, this would not be correct. The Prophet is just explaining what we already have in our own nature. The second thing which is on a similar basis which has been ascribed to the Prophet is the Jalala. So Jalala is an animal uh, whose meat carries a, a particular stink because uh, it eats on, uh, on certain uh, 
I would say certain things uh, which are inappropriate, it, 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 they eat uh, ants and certain other things which are uh, rubbish in nature. And as a result of which their meat carries a certain stink. Now, again, that is something which is an explication of our human nature. So well, the bottom line is that when you find a hadith stating that these animals or these things have also been prohibited, we have to understand that the prophet is not adding to the list of uh, the prohibited items in eating. What it, he's doing is he's just delineating something that we already have in our own human nature or something which is found already in our innate guidance. Similarly, he has also stated that as far as liquor is concerned, alcohol is concerned, uh, this is also something which is uh, whose prohibition is found in our human nature. And the reason that alcohol is prohibited and our own uh, innate guidance vouches for that is that uh, I mean, this is something when we consume in a certain amount, uh, it makes us lose our senses and it makes us lose our faculty of intellect, which is the greatest uh, asset which the Almighty has given us. And uh, so uh, while clarifying this innate guidance that we already have, when the Quran states that liquor is also forbidden and it's like a handiwork of Satan and we should abstain from it, again, we have to understand that the Quran also when it states the prohibition of liquor in, in these stern words, is not making a, I mean, a new list of things, as we said earlier on. And the Quran does not give you a list of prohib prohibited items in general, because these are the things that we already find uh, divinely ordained in our, in our nature. So whether it is Jalala or whether it is uh, animals which have sharp canine teeth or birds which have claws and tentacles, or whether it is this prohibition of liquor, which is of course also found in the Quran. These are basically things which our innate guidance has prohibited. And uh, as now we come what, to, to the fact that what exactly does the Quran do if uh, we know that these items are found in our human nature, which have been prohibited and the prophet and the Quran also has at times explained them, then what exactly has the Quran done uh, regarding this innate guidance or regarding the prohibition, I would say, of edibles. So in this regard, as I, as I said before I answer this question, the way Ustaz Javed Ahmed Ghamidi has answered it in his, in his book, uh, what we need to understand is that the Sharia, which is given to humankind, to mankind, uh, is extremely brief. Uh, the basic premise is that in most things, we ourselves are capable in finding the right path. Our intellect, our own nature, our own conscience have a lot of uh, power in them. They have the capacity given to them by the Almighty to find the right path. So the Sharia only interferes or only guides us where our innate guidance or our own intellect tends to fall short. And uh, it would get confused or maybe doesn't get a, a concrete answer in this regard. So precisely this has happened in the case of the dietary Sharia as well. So there were four things about which human intellect could not have decided whether they should go about consuming these things or not. So what the Quran has, has, does, has done here is that it has actually guided humankind in these four spheres. So this is very important to understand. And uh, uh, I mean, it's not that the Quran is giving some guidance because uh, it was giving some original guidance in this regard, as we said, because as far as original guidance in edibles is concerned, we know what uh, what we have to eat and what we have we don't we don't eat, and uh, and human instincts uh, over the centuries have borne witness to it. It is only in areas where we might falter that the Sharia guides us uh, in general, and in this regard also, it has done the same thing. So there were four things about which there was a chance that we would uh, wrongly interpret, or maybe we would. Uh, uh, be in a confusion as to which path we should follow. So it is in these four things which the Quran has guided us. And these four things, as you can see, are now being displayed before you in the form of a Quranic verse. This is verse 145 of Surah Anam. So the words are, قُلْ لَا أَجِدُوا فِي مَا أُوْحِيَ إِلَيَّ مُحَرَّمًا عَلَىٰ طَاعِمٍ يَتْعُمُهُ إِلَّا أَنْ يَكُونَ مَيْتَةً أَوْ دَمًا مَسْفُوحًا أَوْ لَحْمَ خِنْزِيرٍ فَإِنَّهُ رِتْسٌ أَوْ فِسْقًا now, this is the verse actually, uh, which occurs thrice in the Quran with slight variation of words. And on all these three occasions, it guides us that, well, human intellect could have faltered regarding four areas, and therefore the Almighty 
has given us or revealed and divine, divine guidance in this matter. So let me just translate this verse before you first. Say, I find not in what has been revealed to me through inspiration, forbidden to a person who eats things which are edible, unless it be meat of dead animals. So the first thing which has been prohibited and about which people could have faltered, uh, whether they should eat it or eat it or not, because of course, uh, when a meat, when an animal dies, the question could have arisen. Well, if the animal was alive, we could have, we would have easily eaten it. And uh, why should we not eat it uh, if it, the animal has passed away, or if we should not eat it, or we should eat it? The question could have uh, caused some confusion. So the first thing in which the Quran has given its verdict is that when the person, when the animal which is allowed to you, which is permissible to you. Uh, passes away, it dies, then it is no longer uh, worthy of being consumed. Uh, we'll see the reasoning behind that, but let's first uh, see what the verse tells us. So this is the first thing. The second thing is, uh, the, the thing, or blood which is poured forth, which is daman masfuhan, as you can see. Blood which is poured forth means that the blood, when you slaughter an animal, it comes out, and of course, that is something which is forbidden, uh, implying the fact, yes, that when you slaughter an animal, some part of that blood might remain in the, in the veins and arteries of that animal. So if that is consumed with its meat, then that is not something which is prohibited. But, but the blood which gushes out when you slaughter that animal, of course, it flows in the form of a gushing torrent. That also is forbidden. So the first thing was meat of a dead animal. And in the, in, in the Quran, the term used for a dead animal is maita. Maita means the dead, a dead, a dead animal here. And the second thing which has been prohibited is blood poured forth, which is daman masfuhan. And then the third thing which has been prohibited, as this verse tells us, or the flesh of swine, the flesh of the swine, because all these are unclean or in disobedience to Allah. So the verse actually then says that these are unclean, again, meaning that they are inappropriate to be consumed. So, and then before going on to the fourth thing, uh, it is actually juxtaposed between the, the first three things and the fourth thing that these are unclean. So the words used are fa'inna ritsan aw fisqan. So they are unclean or they are in disobedience to God. And then it is said animals slaughtered in someone else's name. So the, the, the things which are unclean or in disobedience uh, to God. And the fourth thing here, which is stated is that uh, animals which are slaughtered in someone else's name, which means that they are not slaughtered by pronouncing the name of God. So we know that this action of, or this uh, uh, act of pronouncing the name of God at the time of slaughtering an animal is called tasmiya. Tasmiya means to take the name of God, to pronounce the name of God. So the verse tells us that the, the fourth thing which the Almighty has uh, given its dis his decision on is that if an animal is slaughtered such that someone else's name is taken at the time of slaughter, I mean, other than Allah, other than that of God, then that is also forbidden. So these are the four things. We will have, I mean, we'll go into detail with regarding each of these four things, but then we have to understand that this is the list of things which the Quran has uh, uh, given its verdict uh, uh, regarding a, which, and of course, the reason being that human intellect could have gone wrong in this uh, in this direction. And the verse actually ends by telling us uh, and by advising people that in spite of the things that they have been mentioned, which are completely proscribed, completely prohibited, in exceptional circumstances in which a person is pushed in compelling circumstances, even they keep, they can be consumed. So the words are, then he who is constrained by hunger, such that he neither desires to eat nor crosses the limits, incurs no sin. So if a person is uh, forced to hunger, he is in, is in compelling circumstances. If he eats either of these four things, either of these four things, all, all four of them, and his purpose is not that he desires these things, and his purpose is also not that he crosses the limit. Neither does he have a craving for these things, nor if he is able to uh, just eat enough for himself so that he could maintain uh, being alive, he does not cross the limit and starts enjoying them. So the Quran tells us that this concession is there and a person who uh, benefits from this concession, he consumes all these prohibited items when he's compelled and he is uh, in, in a state of uh, compulsion, then he incurs no sin. This is because your Lord is forgiving and merciful. Again, 
the Almighty making it clear to us that in spite of the fact that these four things are some things that we should never ever consume in normal circumstances because of their inappropriate nature, but they could be compelling circumstances. This again, subhanAllah, is a beautiful uh, uh, picture that emerges of our Sharia, of the law of God regarding edibles. And if we read these, this law in the light of uh, the people of the book, uh, the way the Sharia has been enshrined for them, especially how it has been interpreted by their jurists, where it has become extremely difficult to, uh, to, to stay within limits and also consume uh, what they have prescribed. In the backdrop of that, if we are told that even in cases of compelling circumstances, we can consume these prohibitive things uh, as long as we are not desiring them and as long as we are not crossing, the, crossing our limits, this is something which would be okay. This tells us how flexible the Sharia is in this regard even. So now we, let us take up all these four things one by one because there are certain details we have to understand it. Why is it that these things are prohibited? What exactly is the philosophy behind their prohibition? So taking them now in order one by one. The first thing that has been prohibited is maita. Now, the reason why maita or the meat of a dead animal is uh, disallowed is once an animal dies, of course, uh, uh, there is blood in his veins. And uh, if you start consuming that, uh, there is this possibility that we'll also consume the blood which is found in him. And a person who consumes blood, of course, uh, is, is, is a person who, who we look upon as a person who is a savage. A person who would consume blood is someone who is uh, more akin to a beast. So the bottom line here is that we have to understand is that the things that we eat, they have, they have an influence on our lives. And this is something which the Quran tells us. And of course, modern scientific uh, facts also corroborate it, that the things that we eat have a very important and a very potent effect on our lives and our, on the way that we spend them. So it has prohibited carnivores, I mean, uh, meat-eating animals, which tear apart their prey, their prey, or they cut apart up, up their prey through their tentacles or through their canine teeth, uh, and because this, this is mere savagery. And if you follow them in this, uh, in this regard, we eat such animals, uh, which are beasts, uh, then that beastliness is also, uh, is this, there's a chance that it gets transferred to people who consume them. So we have to understand it as far as uh, maita is concerned, or the meat of a dead animal is concerned, it is prohibited because of the presence of blood uh, in that dead animal. And blood itself is something which can only be consumed if a person becomes a beast or if he becomes a savage. At one place, the Quran has actually also explained uh, some of the some of the forms of uh, of a dead animal, because uh, I mean, a person could have said, "Well, what if a animal does not die of its natural death? It could be other uh, other instances as well in which uh, death has uh, occurred." So this is what the Quran also does; that it at times explain explains its original directive. So it said that dead uh, uh, dead animals are are prohibited, and then it went on to explain what those dead animals are under or the nature of that death. Uh, as far as an animal is concerned, in uh, verse 3 of Surah Maida, so that there could be no confusion that uh, whatever the reason that the animal has died has to be taken into account. So I'm just going to read that part before you. This is the third verse of Surah Maida. It says, حُرِّمَتْ عَلَيْكُمُ الْمَيْتَةُ وَالدَّمُ وَلَحْمُ الْخِنْزِيرِ وَمَا أُحِلَّ اللَّهِ بِهِ So exactly the four things which we just discussed earlier on. This verse repeats those four things. Uh, maita, dam, maita is dead animal, dam is blood, lahm al is, is the meat of the swine, and uma uhilla li bihi is, of course, any animal which is slaughtered in someone else's name other than God. So, this, this is the same, uh, I mean, this, these are the four items or uh, entities which have been uh, uh, just, just pronounced here once again. <coughs> but here, what the Quran has done, it is actually uh, given us some more description regarding the regarding maita. So it says that forbidden to you for food or meat of their animals, blood, the flesh of swine, and that on which Allah's name has not been invoked while slaughtering. Now comes that part, which is uh, an explanation of, uh, of the word maita. And that which has been killed by strangling or by a violent blow or by a headlong fall or by the goring of horn, horns, and that which has been eaten by a wild animal, unless you are able to slaughter it before its death. So 
uh, keeping in view some of the questions that have might have arisen, the Quran has further explained that if a, if an animal does not die its natural death, it could be killed by strangling. You just strangle that animal and you just uh, uh, take its life. And then it could be through a violent blow. And then, of course, it could be by the goring of horns or the of a headlong fall. Even all these things, whatever the reason could be, the Quran says that if an animal dies because of these, then they, it has to be classified as maita. And also, lastly, it says that uh, that which is eaten by a wild animal, unless, I mean, that wild animal has uh, uh, preserved that and you are able to slaughter it before it dies. Uh, so if that is the case, then it shall not be recorded at maita and it would be it could be consumed. And there are certain conditions also which come later at that consumption is that you have slaughtered the animal if it has been found alive and the animal which has actually uh, hunted for that is also has not consumed it for itself. It has preserved it for its master. So these uh, this is some of the explanation of the word maita. And one more thing which we have to understand here is, you see, in the Arabic language, words are, are used on the basis of their usage. They are not used on the basis of their uh, meaning or their root meaning in the dictionary. Uh, this is something which is extremely important to realize that in language, the real thing is the usage of that word and not its literal meaning. Because you see what happens is that meanings, they travel and they become uh, stripped of some of its original connotations and then they are, uh, they are meant for specific entities. So this is, a, some, this is a very important principle of the Arabic language. So keeping in mind this particular principle, there is, an ex there is an exception in the Arabic language, and that is when the word maita is spoken, as you can see uh, from, from the scholars' works, uh, all linguistic scholars of Arabic, they, they endorse this, that fish or locust, when they die, they are not classified as maita. Because the usage of, uh, is such that in Arabic language, if a fish is dead, it is not, it's never called maita. Similarly, locust, when it is dead, it is never called maita. So therefore, if we consume dead fish and if we consume dead locust, it would be absolutely fine because they do not come under maita. And this is something which is extremely important, which Ustaz Javed Ahmed Ghamidi has pointed out, that linguistic usage is so important that, well, as far as being dead is concerned, a fish is dead if it's dead, and a locust is dead if it's dead, and every dead animal has been prohibited. That would be the reasoning uh, that would, uh, but a simple person would follow in this regard. But not in case of uh, Arabic linguistics. We have to understand that when people who are classical speakers of the language, they uh, create exceptions. We have to accept those exceptions. So when the word maita is spoken, uh, it it cannot be classified. It cannot be spoken of dead fish, even though it's dead. It similarly cannot be spoken of locust, even though it's dead. So we can consume dead fish, in other words. We can consume dead locusts. And this is what uh, the prophet has actually also uh, explained in, in one of its, his uh, narratives in uh, Sunan of Nisai. It says that, which means its water is pure and its maita is not forbidden. So which means that uh, dead animals or dead sea animals, uh, uh, to be precise, they are not prohi uh, prohibited because the word maita cannot be spoken of them. So uh, we, we need to understand that. And uh, on a very similar note, we have to understand that usage is something which can only uh, govern our understanding of the language. And if we start uh, analyzing a language on the basis of its literal meaning and its roots, this is something that would take us way beyond the correct interpretation. And uh, I can give you this reference from Shatibi, one of the very outstanding uh, jurists of his time. He was a, uh, he belonged to Spain in the eighth century, and exactly this is exactly what he said: that it is the usage of the word uh, which would be given prior attention in its interpretation and not its literal meaning. So exactly the same thing you can find that Ustaz Yaweed Ahmed Ramadi has uh, iterated here. And of course, uh, this is a very important principle of language itself. Next, the thing which has been prohibited is, of course, blood. And I've already explained this, uh, that blood is something which can only be consumed by a person who is a beast or a savage. And a person who would consume blood is bound to have the effect of that consumption. So for that very reason, blood has also been prohibited. But remember, 
uh, as we have seen from the words that the words which have been spoken of this type of blood, the expression which has been used is daman masfuhan, which means flowing blood, blood which gushes forth, which actually tells us that as far as, far as that part of the blood is concerned, which remains within the veins or the arteries of an animal which might get stuck to the meat. Uh, if you consume that, if you cook that, then that shall not be uh, that, that shall not, not come under the label of prohibition. So this is the second thing which has been uh, delineated. The third thing is the swine or the pig. Uh, now the pig, of course, is something which could have all, always raised this question whether it is prohibited or not. Why? The reason is that you see what has happened is that generally carnivores, meat-eating animals, which tear up the flesh of, it, of their prey, they are prohibited because tearing up the flesh to your sharp teeth or to your tentacles that creates that image of beastliness. Uh, on the other hand, animals which are herbivores, which eat grass, vegetation, they have generally been, generally been allowed. Now, the question here is that uh, in most cases, we have a very distinct uh, distribution or, di or, or a very distinct category of herbivores and carnivores uh, in, this, in this regard. But there is one animal, which is the swine or the pig, uh, which could have created confusion because it has both properties. It's a carnivore also, it's a herbivore also. It, it, it eats meat as well, and at the same time, uh, like the sheep and the goat, it also consumes vegetation. So in other words, it also has a beastly nature, and it also has the nature of animals which are more appropriate for eating, like for example, the cow uh, or, the, or the goat. So the question was that how should we treat this pig? Should we class it amongst the carnivores or should we class it among the herbivores which eat vegetation? Uh, and this, of course, would have been a question that uh, would have always uh, created debate among scholars and amongst people that, well, one could have said that its carnivorous nature is, is more prevalent on its herbivorous nature and vice versa as well. But the Quran here gave its verdict and said, well, although it also eats vegetation like other uh, normal animals which are appropriate for eating, but its carnivorous nature is dominant over its herbivorous nature. And so therefore it has also been prohibited. So precisely this is the reason why the animal called the swine is prohibited. So basically we have to understand that the reason for prohibiting animals in general is that beastliness is that savagery uh, which is present in, in, in those forms of animal, those sorts of animal. So of course, uh, blood is something which we can clearly see has that uh, savagery in itself when we consume it. A dead animal also, because the blood still is, is stuck in its veins, is, uh, is classified uh, in the same category. And animals, uh, of course, which are uh, beasts, I mean, they are, they are beasts in the form that they are carnivores and they tear up and open their, the flesh of their prey, they have also been prohibited uh, because, as I said, that the reason is that whatever you consume, that consumption has an effect on uh, your own uh, lifestyle. Now, the fourth thing which has been prohibited is is the uh, is matruku tasmiya is the as a, is the Arabic term. Matruku tasmiya mean that you give up tasmiya, that you do not pronounce the word of God uh, while you slaughter that animal. So this is again something which the Almighty says that it is uh, forbidden because uh, when you dedicate an animal to someone, some other deity, for example, or some other person or being that would open the doors of uh, polytheism, that you're dedicating an animal to someone else. So life is something which can only be taken, even if that is of an animal. Of course, human life is, cannot be even thought of being uh, taken. But if you can take the life of an animal also, uh, only if you seek God's permission. And the, the reason or the way that you seek God's permission in this regard is that you take his name at the time of slaughter. So when you say, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar, which is the takbir, you are actually seeking God's permission that yes, uh, if I'm taking the animal's life, it is because it is at your behest. Otherwise, I'm not even authorized to take the life of an animal. So this is the reason that animals which are slaughtered in someone else's name, they are prohibited because it opens the door to polytheism. And on this very principle, the Quran has also prohibited some other things. So you see, uh, I have been all along telling you that at, besides that, that basic principle in which the Quran upholds, or on which the Quran upholds is that human guidance regarding, in, regarding the prohibition of animals is something in which it is self-sufficient, except, of course, 
uh, there are four things which we, we, are, we have just discussed. And in this regard, it has also explained certain things. This is what we call the, what, what we call the fiqh al-Quran. And Ustaz Zawad Ibn Ramadi has coined this term that just as you find the Sharia being given by the Quran, it also answers certain questions, certain offers certain clarifications. And these answering of questions and these clarifications are not the Sharia per se. They amount to an explanation of that Sharia by God himself. And this is what he has classified as the fiqh al-Quran, or how the Quran actually explains certain things. So precisely on this, this, uh, on this basis, it has explained some other things, uh, which, which of course are tantamount to taking someone other's name at the time of slaughter. So uh, the words that we studied earlier on, Surah Maida's uh, third verse, it has these words as well. وَمَا زُبِحَ عَلَى النُّسُبْ وَأَن تَسْتَقْسِمُوا بِالْأَزْلَامِ ذَلِكُمْ فِسْقِ And what is slaughtered in the stone altars and forbidden also is the division of meat by raffling with arrows. This is an act of disobedience. So this is something which happened in, in the in Arabs in, in the times of uh, Prophet Muhammad before his advent also that animals would be slaughtered at, at altars, at stone altars of, of mausoleums of other, of, of other people like saints. And similarly, there would be raffling of arrows in which meat would be gambled and the, the meat that would person would win as a result of that gambling would be distributed among the poor people. So this raffling of arrows was also prohibited because of course, this is something which is akin to taking something, uh, I mean, taking the name of someone other than God. <clears throat> Another important thing which the Quran has again offered as its own fiqh, as its own explanation of its original sharia, uh, which we know is also something which has been handed down uh, by the established sunnah of the prophets of God. That is that even if no name is taken while slaughtering an animal, that, is also, that animal is also prohibited. So what the Quran is telling us is that positively the name of God has to be taken whenever you slaughter an animal. So not only someone else's name should not be taken, that is something which we have already discussed. And if no name is taken, even then you cannot slaughter an animal because this is a permission which only God gives. And this is again the Fikul Quran, the understanding or the interpretation offered by the Quran in verse 121 of Surah Anam. The words are Wala ta'kulu mimma lam yuzkirismullahi alayhi wa innahu la fisq. And eat not that animal on which Allah's name has not been pronounced at the time of its slaughter, for this is fisk. And if even Allah's name has not been pronounced, for that is fisk. And certainly the devils do inspire their friends to dispute, dispute with you uh, in this matter as well. So be informed that if, they, if you obey them, then you would indeed be polytheists. So things in which no name has been taken, the name of God has been not taken, uh, are equally prohibited. And again, as I said, this is something we have to uh, understand uh, with, with regard to the uh, taking of God's name is concerned. So um, as far as uh, animals are concerned, I mean, uh, which we hunt, for example, they are, this is, there is an instance in which we train animals and we start hunting them. So that is also a corollary which has been dealt with Ustaz, by the Ustaz Javed al Ghamidi in, in, uh, in his book. So he says that the same prohibition applies for a slaughtered animal or prey on which although the name of Allah is taken, but the person who takes this, this name does not believe in God or subscribes to polytheism by associating other deities with him. For this very reason, besides Muslims themselves, the Quran has only allowed animals slaughtered by the people of the book since they originally subscribed to monotheism. So because uh, of this polytheistic practice, because of the fact that you cannot slaughter an animal uh, in someone else's name, say God's name, he says he has made this ishtahad, he has actually made this analogy, I would say, or made this qiyas, which tells us that if a person who slaughters that animal is not someone who subscribes to monotheism, he's not a Muslim or he's not from among the people of the book, and he's a polytheist, he openly subscribes to polytheism. If that person slaughters an animal, then that too would not be allowed because you cannot make a difference or discriminate between polytheism, which uh, of course is a result of the fact that you are slaughtering that animal without taking God's name or the person himself is, uh, who is slaughtering that animal is someone who is uh, indulging in polytheism because he himself is a professed polytheist. So this is an important analogy 
that he has made. And actually, the people of the book uh, are the only exception besides Muslims because they adhere to monotheism. And we find that the Quran telling us, Al-Yawma uhilla lakum at-tayyibat wa ta'amu al-lazina utu al-kitab uhillu lakum wa ta'amukum hillu lakum. All clean things have this day been made lawful to you and the food to whom the people of the book was given is lawful for you, lawful to you and you for them, or you to them. So you see, the reason that the uh, food of the people of the book is made lawful for us is their subscription to monotheism, which is something which, have to be, uh, which is, has to be understood. Uh, I'm just going to give you a brief overview of the fact, and we've already discussed this earlier on, that the concession that has been given, that we discussed earlier on, of course, is important to note that unless, I mean, I mean, a person who is given this concession, of course, if he's pushed, uh, I mean, he can only utilize his concession when he's pushed, when he's uh, undergoing compelling circumstances. And unless he has, uh, is, he, he indulges in craving for that meat, which is prohibited, or he crosses the limit, that should not be the case. So the Quran says, فَمَنِسْ فِي مَخْمَسَةٍ غَيْرَ مُتَجَانِفٍ لِلْإِسْمِ He who is constrained by hunger to eat what is forbidden without inclination to showing sin. So we find Allah forgiving and merciful. So if you have to eat something which is prohibited, it should not be with the willingness of the heart. It should not be because you're inclined to do it. Uh, and of course, this is uh, in line with the fact that you're just being compelled to do it. You would not like to do it, but you have to do it because you would like to survive. Now, uh, in the, at, the, at the very uh, end of this, this talk, which, in which Ustaz Javed Ahmed Ghamidi uh, we have to be talking about his, his uh, concept of, uh, of, of the dietary laws of uh, the Quran. An important uh, thing to note is that as far as the things which are prohibited are concerned, we have to understand that this prohibition only relates to their consumption, to their eating. If they have some other use, it is perfectly all right. Just to give you an example, consumption of alcohol is prohibited. But if that alcohol is, for example, used as a, as a scent, as a perfume, which you spray on your body, uh, you cannot say that this is something which is prohibited. And, uh, and therefore, when we see uh, uh, businesses thriving and shopkeepers saying that we have halal perfumes, it is a mockery of, what, what, of our understanding. Because if you have to understand that what is forbidden is their consumption, is, is their eating. If you have some other use for that, particular proscribed thing that is perfectly fine. And we find this from the words or the, or the mouth of the Prophet himself. Uh, and he went, once when he chanced by a dead animal, uh, he, he actually asked this question that why is this, 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 uh, this dead animal lying there and why is it not being used for purposes like making it useful its hide or its skin? And people said, well, it's, it's dead. The Prophet said, well, if it's dead, you should not eat it. But what about some of the other uses it might have? So this narrative that you see from the Sahih of Imam Muslim being displayed before you is exactly what the Prophet said. And he said this about a dead animal. And he said that, well, if you th see that dead goat that he passed by uh, and people did not make use of it, he said, well, you just, you just can use it for other purposes. If you're not eating the goat, that's fine because that is prohibited. But you can always use it for other purposes, which gives us this principle that only Consumption, which means um, uh, our consumption with our, with our mouths is something which has been prohibited regarding these uh, proscribed items. Other uses of this, uh, of these uh, four or three items which we have mentioned are perfectly allowed. Finally, viewers, Ustaz Javed Ahmed Ghamadi has also uh, written about the taskia, or what exactly is meant by the taskia, or what exactly is the right form of slaughter uh, which is allowed. So we just discussed the fact that earlier on, the Quran has just uh, described the things which have been proscribed. And in one of the verses, which we discussed earlier on, Surah Maida, the words are you, the words which it has used is Illa ma zakkaitum. And the zakka here is with a zal, with a za, not a za, not with a ze. So taskia with a ze is purification, but taskia with a zal is slaughtering an animal in a way that all its blood gushes forth. So the only form in which an animal is allowed to you is that you slaughter it in a way that you do taskia. And the taskia is the same as the word zib, which means that you slaughter an animal from its juggler vein in a way that the blood gushes forth. And as a result, it, this process cleanses the body of the animal from blood. Only that blood will now remain in the body of an animal which, which gets stuck to the meat. So that is okay. 
but all the blood is now drained away uh, from the body of the animal. And if, therefore, this, there is no reason to call such an animal to be a maita. So taskia is the only form of uh, slaughter that makes um, a, a dead animal to be allowed to you because you're not actually, uh, and what you're doing is you're actually killing that animal in a specific way, which does not render it to be a maita. In the case of a camel, uh, a, a different term is used, and that is nahar. And you, most of you would have heard this term. Uh, so just as the word zibh is used for, for goats and for sheep or for cows, the word nahar is used for, uh, and for, for big animals, like, for example, uh, the camel. And the purpose is the same, that you cut open the jugular vein or the life vein of that animal, and the blood actually oozes out. In fact, it rushes and gushes out, and it, it, all of it is drained. Uh, and so therefore, we have to understand that. The prophet has also said that it's not essential that you slaughter uh, something exactly from the place that you do it. For example, you do it from its life vein. It could be some other. I mean, you could use it from, uh, you can slaughter that animal uh, from some other place as well. So this narrative that you can see, which is being displayed before you exactly explains this. And that is that, uh, I'm just going to read the translation. Adi ibn Hatim says, O oh, messenger of Allah, is it okay to slaughter a prey with a stone or a piece of wood? If the prey is at hand and we do not have a knife to slaughter it. So if you use something else, some, some sharp thing instead of a knife, the prophet said, drain out the blood with whatever you have and take the name of God on it. So it's not essential that you're always using a knife. It's perfectly okay that if you use it, uh, if you use something else. Now, in this regard, the Quran has also taken up one more thing. And that is that if you use trained, trained animals to hunt animals, uh, the Quran says it is perfectly okay. And in, especially in the case of dogs and in the, uh, in the case of uh, or other beasts which have been trained for this purpose, the Quran tells us that if that beast or that dog is let loose on the prey uh, in a way that before you let loose the animal, you say, Bismillah, Allah Akbar, with your own, in your own mouth, and then you let loose and unleash that animal, it goes and catches uh, that its prey. And then you find that prey alive and uh, uh, if it is slaughtered by the teeth of that animal, you find alive, and then you, you if it is, it is not found alive, I mean, if, you, if the animal has already, uh, the, the trained animal has already cut it open through its uh, mouth, and it's fine. However, it should not have consumed it for its own self. This is what the Quran uh, tells us. It should have preserved it for the, its master. So the words used by the Quran are, Yes, aluna kamaza uhillalahum kul uhillalakum at they ask you what is lawful to you. Say, all good things are lawful to you as well as the prey of the beasts you have taught, training them as Allah has taught you. So eat of what they caught for you or what they catch for you. And before you let loose the beast to catch the prey, pronounce upon it the name of God and have fear of God Swift is he in his account. So, in other words, what we have to do is that if that beast has caught that animal, uh, that trained uh, beast or the tra trained animal has caught your prey, uh, as long as it has not consumed it for itself, uh, you, can, uh, you can use that animal as long as you unleash that, uh, that uh, trained animal, to, which, which is used for hunting, by pronouncing the words, Bismillah, Allah, Akbar. So, at the time of release of that, of that hunting animal, you have to pronounce those words. Precisely, this is what the Prophet has, uh, has said in one of his narratives of Surah Nasa. It says, when you re release your dog to catch the prey, take the name of Allah while doing so. If you then see that it has not killed the prey, slaughter it in the prescribed way and take Allah's name while, while slaughtering it. So this shows that if that animal has cut open uh, its prey and the, and the animal has died, it is fine. It, in other words, the teeth of that trained animal will act as the knife, so to speak. And if it passes away as a result of that, it, it is killed, then you have already said the takbir when you have unleashed that trained dog. And if that dog has now killed the prey, as long as it has not used it for himself, then it is perfectly halal. However, if the animal is found, uh, I mean, it's found alive, that what you can do is you can then, when you reach that place where you find that slaughtered animal or that, that uh, hunted animal lying there, you can then slaughter it for your own self and, and then, of course, consume it. So this is what the Prophet has said. If you, if you then see that it has, not been, it has not killed the prey, slaughter it in the prescribed way and take Allah's name while slaughtering it. If it has killed the prey but did not take a bite, 
If it has killed with prey but did not take a bite, that you can eat it, since it has preserved it for you. However, if it has eaten from the prey, then such a prey is forbidden for you, because the beast of prey has in this case preserved it for itself. And if you see other dogs besides others besides yours who have also killed the prey, then do not eat from it, and since you do not know which of the dogs has actually killed the prey. So this is just a caution which uh, the Hadith is telling us uh, in its uh, uh, near the end. Otherwise, virtually by all means and by all intents and purposes, if the trained dog or the trained animal has killed the prey, it is fine. It is which would be perfectly halal as long as that dog was let loose by the words of Bismillah Allahu Akbar. And if it has not killed it, I mean, also not consumed it, then when you reach the place where the animal is lying there, you just slaughter it for your own self and, and then you can consume it. And, and as a side uh, to this, I can also say that look how the Quran tells us that this is a, this is a uh, discipline of knowledge which God has taught us to do uh, in this regard. And so therefore, we have to understand that if we do... Uh, the tuskia of an animal, tuskia with the zal, which means slaughter in, in a proper way, then whether you use a knife, whether you use a rifle, whether you use a revolver or any other thing, as long as these, these requirements are fulfilled, it is absolutely fine. So, viewers and folks, this brings me to an end to uh, presenting the views of my teacher, Javed Ahmed Ghamidi, regarding the dietary laws. Just to sum up once again uh, what we have discussed here, first, we have to, to understand that as far as the a prohibition of uh, edibles and drinks are concerned. This is something which the Almighty has already ingrained in our in our in our cells. We already know we don't eat things uh, like lions and vultures and tigers because they are not made for these things. I mean, they're not made for eating, and they are all beasts and 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 savage animals, for so to speak. And as far as the Quran is concerned, it has only uh, given guidance on those four. Uh, edibles which we just discussed because there could have been some confusion because there could have been some debate regarding these four things and this is an, exactly with line with what the sharia the temperament of the sharia in which it only guides human intellect where it is liable to falter only where it is liable to falter otherwise it lets it take the decision itself and then of course we also saw from of these some of the explanations of prophet what exactly in this regard is to be uh, upheld in all circumstances and how we have to also uh, consider the word meta to have a linguistic connotation. Similarly, we have also to understand it as far uh, as the concession regarding uh, these uh, animals is concerned, which are prohibited. They can be consumed in without, I mean, in, in compelling circumstances. And also a very important uh, thing that we studied that things which are prohibited, they are prohibited for eating only. Their other uses are absolutely permissible. And finally, we studied what exactly the word taskia means. The taskia, the word taskia is different from tazkia, which is which means a purification uh, of the soul or for, for for our own deeds and practices. The word tazkia with a zal actually means slaughtering an animal such that all its blood gushes forth. And we also studied the wisdom behind the prohibition of these four edibles or these four items. So this brings me into an end uh, in presenting his views. And uh, inshallah. Uh, as we go along, we'll be discussing some of his other views, which he has presented in his book, uh, Mizan. And now I am available for any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, Dr. Saleem, for this comprehensive lecture on dietary laws. Um, before we start taking uh, questions, I'd like to let the participants know that the priority is going to be given to topic-specific questions. And then We'll continue on with non-topic specific questions. So Riaz, uh, please go ahead. You're up first. Uh, Salaam alaikum, Dr. Sir. Well, yes. <laughs> uh, Dr. Sir, it has been argued that the, it is in human nature that you, you can differentiate between the tayyab and the khabis. Mm -hmm. When we look at the Chinese culture, they eat all mm -hmm. kinds of things. So is it that um, right. is it, so culture plays a role in there? Mm -hmm. I think uh, in this case, uh, uh, a lot of things play their perversion of human nature that does play its role. And also this perversion has to be looked upon over centuries of human, uh, human behavior. So if you, if, you, if you look upon human behavior in general, all mankind, if you look upon all mankind ever since uh, it was born right up to uh, today, uh, you'll find a very, very vast majority ever since it was born. Uh, 
I think we're having some technical issues. Uh, let's wait for a bit. Dr. Sling, are you back? Yes, uh, I, I am just uh, waiting for a signal from our technical person here. Thank you. <clears throat> so now, can you hear me now? Yes, we can, um, okay. except we don't have a video from your side. Can I video me on? Okay. Okay, now you're back. Um, but you, we can't hear you anymore. <laughs> can you hear me now? Yes, now we can. Thank you. Okay, should I answer this question again? Yeah, can you please start from the beginning? Okay. So the question uh, was asked that uh, if uh, this innate guidance is so clear, why is it that the Chinese uh, and many Eastern nations, they have a different view of uh, our dietary laws? and they consume a lot of things which generally human beings do not consume. So I started answering this question by saying that uh, when you pick up a sample uh, regarding what uh, people do or uh, they don't do, you just don't concentrate on a particular area of the globe and that too for a particular period of time. So if we take the whole humankind as a sample in this regard, we'll find that ever since the creation of uh, Adam and of course uh, after him, we had all of the prophets of God and a very big, and a huge chunk of uh, Muslim uh, of religious history in which uh, prophets of God came. Uh, if you if you uh, count humanity ever since that uh, era from that period up to right up till now, you will find that this is an exception uh, which the Chinese and some of the other nations indulge in. So if they do this, they are actually. Uh, I mean, they, the reasons could be several. That this could be because of perversion of human nature. This could be because some of the external and influential and environmental factors as well uh, that we can analyze. But uh, if people say that, why is it that uh, their innate guidance is not guiding them and the way it is guiding the rest of humankind? The answer, as I said, would be. Uh, that humankind as a, as a whole has to be taken in this regard. And if you take it as a whole, ever since the inception of mankind right up to today, you will find, I mean, I could say, uh, if I have, uh, I can go on and say that maybe even 90% or 95% of humankind has always remained uh, averse to eating such things as these uh, Chinese eat. So if their uh, nature is telling them something different, it's, a, it's an exceptional case. It's a case of perversion. And that perversion is something which has its origins in, in, in a lot of things which can be analyzed and discussed. Thank you very much, Dr. Salim. Our next question comes from Bisma Dermizi Ahmed. Please go ahead. Uh, Assalamualaikum, Dr. Salim. Uh, my question was, how do we categorize langars at mazars and the food that people distribute at the bursi of a loved one? Uh, here, okay. there, these are distributed amongst the poor for the most part. Uh, which is what explains it, and that's how people explain it. But the idea behind the food distribution is for sabab of the mm. departed. So, how would this okay. fit in into the categories? So, I mean, if it is, yeah, if the food is not dedicated to any other person, because of course Muslims would not uh, dedicate to a deity; they could dedicate it for the dead person or to some other saint. If that is not the case, and if it's just a pure question of feeding the poor. Uh, in, in, in such places or in the case of a deceased person's uh, death, uh, I mean, we cannot say that it is prohibited. So it, it all depends on the, the intention or the way uh, we would we present it. Uh, if there is no such thing involved, if you're not dedicating the food to any other person or deity, it's, it's absolutely fine. But if you think that you are doing this uh, by dedicating it to the, death, to the dead person or to someone else, then we should abstain from consuming it. Okay. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Saleem. Next up, we have Akram Bhatti. Please go ahead. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Wa alaikum assalam. Sir, we have been informed that if there is no person who does not believe in Allah, and that he has been slaughtered, and that he has been slaughtered, then we can't eat it. So, the people who say that Christian and Raila Kitab, they say that they are very strong, and they say that they are very strong, and they say that they are very strong, so I think I answer this question by saying that even though the people of the book, uh, they are uh, incriminated with various forms of polytheism, but they still subscribe to monotheism. And this was the case even at the time of the revelation of the Quran. Uh, the Christians of those times still call themselves I mean, still had this belief that Jesus is the son of God. But in spite of that, God allowed it. Why? Because you see, when they say that he's the son of God, they don't uh, interpret it to mean that it's a form of polytheism. They say that this is monotheism and they explain it in a certain way. The Quran does not accept this explanation, but because they themselves say that they are monotheists, the Quran has accepted that. So we eat their food because primarily they are monotheists. And their example is the, the example of a Muslim who is, is, who is a person who subscribes to Tawheed. But still he goes to shrines and prostrates before saints and he starts uh, uh, invoking that saint that uh, please pray for me that God accepts my, my wish. So you see the, the case of a Muslim is also no different. He might subscribe to monotheism, but he might deviate and, have, and follow certain polytheistic practices. So the case of a Christian is also the same, that primarily they, are, they, they, they believe in one God. But that belief in one God has that deviation. It has, uh, I mean, a wrong ring, ring to it. And the Quran actually uh, accepted this uh, when it said that, I mean, because you see that the Christians of the times of the prophet himself, they, they, they believed to be Jesus to be the son of God. And in spite of that, the, the Quran allowed their meat to be consumed because, as I said, they were primarily monotheists. And they had deviated into practices of polytheism, just as Muslims are primarily monotheists but they do certain uh, certain uh, acts of polytheism. So doing certain acts of polytheism does not make a person polytheist. It, also, it only makes him a deviant monotheist. Just to clarify my mind, I'm going to ask you one little question again. Okay. Uh, if or now you know, people who live in you know, on Europe or America, uh, we don't eat that meat because once it's not slaughtered, at all. Mm -hmm. If they slaughtered it, then that that uh, confusion would come in uh, place. I think what you are mentioning, right. but not yes, not because you yeah, if confusion. you yeah, when you when you are well, in link such countries, the reason for your not consuming uh, such meat is because the name of God has not been invoked. So that is another uh, important uh, uh, distinction that has to be made. So you see, the distinctions are three. The name of God has to be positively taken. The the per, uh, the uh, the way that you slaughter that animal has to be in a way that all the blood gushes out. And thirdly, the person who slaughters should be primarily a monotheist. So these are the three conditions which have to be met for halal slaughter. The three yeah, conditions. Some people over here, person, they, go, they go to Jews uh, shops and they, they, yeah. they say that's okay because the uh, Jews... Yes, okay. it is okay because you see the Jews, they, they, when they eat kosher, uh, they invoke the name of God, uh, yes. to the best of my understanding. That, yes. so, so precisely for this reason, the name of God is taken, the slaughter is done in the correct way, so the blood gushes out, and of course, Jews are monotheists as well. So always remember that there are these three conditions. Whenever they are fulfilled, you will say that the slaughter is a halal slaughter, and uh, it can be consumed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Salim. I had a question of my own, and this is like related to you know, there are people that eat all kinds of meat, despite being Muslims, they don't care if it's the Biha or not. And I know that you're, if you go to someone's place, and they know that you only eat the Biha, then you should assume, you know, in goodwill that they will offer you what's halal. But I've had instances where some of my friends have offered me things, and then it turned out that they weren't really halal. Um, or at least, I didn't see them as being halal. And mm. so in, the, in those situations, you know, with Ramadan coming, is it okay to question whoever's house you're going to if what they're presenting you with is halal or should you abstain from doing that? 
I think uh, if they themselves say that they are offering halal meat, we, it is enough that you, I mean, trust them. Uh, in case of a breach of trust, maybe, or maybe if you are slightly doubtful, you can always ask that, well, uh, we are bound by our religion to eat certain things and not eat certain things. And I think people respect this uh, a lot. So, uh, I mean, uh, in the first case, it's perfectly fine to trust them. But it could be the case that uh, by trusting them, because they themselves not, might not be knowing whether they are doing the right thing or not, and later on, they, uh, you get to know. So even if you ask them that this is how uh, you are required to eat certain things, I don't think it should be a problem and it should uh, be a cause of any consternation or, or, uh, or bother. Uh, however, if there is, I mean, this is not possible, then uh, I think if you just trust the person on his word that, uh, yes, uh, we are offering halal meat and we know what halal meat is, uh, I think that should be sufficient. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Salim. Moving on to non-topic specific questions. So this one comes from the chat and it says, I have a question uh, regarding Surah Al-Fatiha in connection to the term Rabbil Alameen. And the question is, mm -hmm. Alameen is al alamin is generally interpreted as the worlds or the universe, but the plural plural of al alam or for the worlds is al awalim, not al alamin. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. in Arabic, all of these words that end with in correspond to human beings, uh, specifically to male human beings, but in general they could also be for any gender. For example, Muslimin, Sajidin, and so on. And so from, from this interpretation, you know, taken together, can we say that Rabb al-Alamin specifically refers to the to all human beings, whether dead or alive, instead of the world or the universe? First, I think uh, this is not correct to say that the, the plural alim, alimun or alamin is not correct and only the plural uh, is awalim. Uh, this is common knowledge that uh, alamin is uh, equally a plural word. Uh, and the second important thing is that in the Arabic language, in classical Arabic, uh, plurals are not always used to connote multiple entities. They are also used to connote the vastness or the uh, unboundedness of something. So, for example, uh, Rabbul Mash uh, Rabbul Wal Magharib, as you can see in the Quran, that he is the Lord of the Easts and the Wests. The Mashariq, Ma Mashariq is the plural of Mashriq, Magharib is the plural of Maghrib. Uh, similarly, you see words uh, like hasarat mean that uh, I mean hasarat means uh, regret, but it is used in the in the plural uh, and doesn't mean a lot of shame. It only, of course, reflects the uh, the abundance of something. So we have to understand that uh, in classical Arabic language, first, as I said, I think I need to correct the person who has asked this that uh, alimun is also an equally plural word uh, of the word alim, uh, alim, and secondly. Uh, in Arabic, classical Arabic, plurals are not always meant for multiplicity. They are also meant to connote the vastness. The word Rabbul Alameen, uh, as a result, would mean uh, the Lord of this vast universe, I mean, this, this expansive universe. Uh, instead of translating it to be the Lord of the worlds or the Lord of uh, the universe, uh, all the universes, uh, the connotation of the word Alameen here is the vastness of the expanse of what, has, of, of what God has created. Thank you very much for that clarification, Dr. Sleem. Next up, we have Riaz Khan. Please go ahead. Starting back. Uh, we know, we know um, from the Sunnah of Prophet ﷺ that whenever he traveled or during the rain, he combined Zuhar and Asr. Um, so what does these imams play the role, like the Imam Shafi'i and so on? So according to Shafi'i, you can't do it according to Hanafi, you can do it type of deal. So when established that the Prophet ﷺ, Sunnah is there, how do you distinguish between one, Im one Imam's decision versus the other? This is uh, on the basis of their own principles which they have formulated. So you see uh, the Hanafis, if they do something, they have their own principles of jurisprudence. For example, they would say that something which, was, uh, which should have been done in, in a way that uh, many people should have reported an incident, but only few people end up reporting that incident, then that thing is not reliable. To give an example, they would say if there was a fire somewhere and only a couple of people report that, maybe one person, whereas there was a whole population which was, uh, who was witnessing that fire or maybe in, or affected by it. So uh, in that case, if one person says that it was this, this event had happened, then we would not believe that person because this is against common sense that all the rest would not say so. 
So similarly, the Shawafe and the Hanabilas and the Malikis, I'm just giving you one example. They have formulated their principles of uh, jurisprudence as per which uh, they interpret uh, the, uh, the whole uh, practice of the Prophet. Another, another example is, for example, the Malikis or the uh, people who follow the Maliki law, for example, in North Africa, in Spain, uh, they would see what the Prophet, when he, when he shortened his prayer, uh, they would typically say that it was for 40, after 40 miles, maybe, or after 30 miles, or whatever distance that they interpret. Uh, the reason is that they rely on certain narratives in which the Prophet shortened his prayer uh, after such a, such a mileage that he had traveled. But you see other imams doing it on a lesser, for, on a, for, a, for a lesser period of time, for example, nine miles, or for maybe five days or seven days. So each of these uh, jurists, they formulate their own uh, interpretation as a result of their principles, which I just referred to. And for one, these principles would say that we have to look upon the prophet uh, or one of these of the prophet, which is stronger than the rest, which tells us, well, this is the, this is the time period for shortening the prayers. We cannot do it beyond that time period. And this is the extent of the mileage uh, that has to be traveled to shorten the prayer. And the other, for example, jurists would, uh, on the other hand, say that, that some other narratives which are stronger than what you have interpreted, then they don't refer to, let's say, 40 miles or 50 miles. They say it's 9 miles or 11 miles. So either they will rely on a hadith, which to them would be more uh, powerful than the person or the, than the hadith, which the other imam has relied upon, or as I said, they would have some, some of their own principles. So this is basically uh, a, a, a line of reasoning, which just uh, is consequential to the principles that they have formulated. And, and, and there are subtle differences uh, regarding uh, the principles that have been formulated by all these four uh, giant people. So would the same principle apply to the prayers when uh, Prophet Sallallahu as it said that he combined the Asr and Zohar together? Would I think if you ask me, uh, as I said, I mean, if you ask me the way I have studied it, I think that uh, it's a question of your personal preference. I mean, the Prophet himself, if you look at various narratives, he, he shortened his prayer uh, on different occasions uh, for different distances because basically it was his personal discomfort. On some occasions, he felt that discomfort after 10 miles. On certain other occasions, he felt it after 30 miles. So instead of uh, relating it to the discomfort, people started relating it to the distance which he had traveled. So the, 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 the essence of whole, this whole matter is, it's not the distance that you have traveled, it's the discomfort which has actually inflicted you. So as long as you feel that discomfort, and what do I mean by discomfort? Discomfort means the discomfort of the journey itself. When you're traveling, of course, you're not in a, in, in a very comfortable position. You have certain things that you, in normal circumstances, that you would not uh, have. So the, as long as you feel the discomfort of the journey, uh, you are authorized to shorten the prayer. And uh, as I said, it's not just a journey. It could be other reasons as well. So discomfort could be because of uh, sickness. It could be because of uh, any other valid reason, something which is uh, out of the normal. So when something which is out of the normal happens, uh, is it, it warrants uh, uh, or gives the person the authority. It could be subjective, of course, to decide for himself or herself. Thank you very much, Dr. Salim. Next up, we have Bismuth <clears throat> Tirmizi Ahmed again. Please go ahead. Bismuth, you're up next. Please go ahead. Sorry. Uh, Salam alaikum, Dr. Salim. I was, uh, last night I was listening to the lecture on the first revelation. And um, what uh, I have understood from it is that the, the idea of Ghare Hira somehow does not fit into the narrative. Now, of course, all mm -hmm. my life, I've, I've believed that Ghari Hira is where the revelation happened. And then so many other people who I speak to, you know, I have, uh, I feel it's so hard to convince people. My question to you is, you know, in Christianity, we see a lot of Greek mythology kind of, that mythology bled into the belief. Is there any history of some cave where revelations happened and that's how it crept into storytelling if that did not really happen and it's fictional mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the prophet only got his revelations, uh, you know, at, at ground level in Makkah or Medina. Um, is there any references? Because I was trying to find them last night, but is there anything you can point me to uh, towards uh, as far as the reference of Ghare Hira? Is there, there, are, there, are, there are no such references. The only references that narrative of Bukhari 
but uh, as far as the go, uh, the uh, prophet stationing himself in the cave of hira is concerned we do find in the sirat of ibn ishaq one of the foremost uh, uh, biographies of the prophet in which the prophet would go and do itikaf in the bari hira and that is an a, a totally different thing uh, from the quran being revealed to him so it does seem that because the kaaba or the baitullah was uh, i mean th- it had a number of idols uh, in the times of uh, when the prophet was living in mecca and uh, so perhaps it was to his distaste that he would go and do it the kaf there so we do have this uh, this uh, news from uh, the biography of ibn ishaq which tells us that the prophet and even before the prophet his uh, his grandfather and, and the quraish in general they had this tradition that the ghare hira or the cave of hira would be used for Uh, this uh, isolation for this uh, stationing of uh, uh, in isolation is concerned that we do in itikaf so they did this itikaf in in the cave of era and that is all that we know but revelation of the quran is something which i mean which is actually something that we got to know from that narrative of imam bukhari uh, which we see in bukhari uh, tasayyuh bukhari otherwise this is something that uh, will not feature it will not feature anywhere else okay so basically the un- then the understanding is that he did go for itikaf there Um, yeah but he did not he did go with it but he never received happened. yeah okay. correct okay okay thank you so much appreciate that thank you very much dr <clears throat> salim that was it for all of the questions today um before we end the session early uh, i'd like to let the participants know that starting ramadan dr salim is going to have a daily series starting 9 pm pakistan time and uh, so we won't be continuing with these uh weekend sessions until after ramadan inshallah inshallah we'll be having tomorrow's session inshallah all right that that was all for today thank you so much dr salim and assalamu alaikum but that that Mariko. that uh, last one question that uh, daily session is going to be this um, about this textual uh, quran or something else no no the in the daily session would be uh, regarding <laughs> self improvement uh from the quran how we can improve ourselves uh from the guidance that we get from the quran so basically they would be more educative and they are more uh spiritual uh, uh spiritual fodder i would say then after ramadan we will we will uh, we'll resume inshallah we'll resume, resume the textual quran thank you sir yeah. thank you sorry one last question would recording be available for these because i think during that 9 o'clock time we will have we will be in tarawi so Yes, of course. We, that the recording would be available. Thank you. That was all. Salam alaikum.